Hello, and welcome to this NJCU Center for the Arts digital event. We would like to ask everyone to please keep your cameras and microphones off during the program. There will be a Q&A section at the end of the program, and we will only be accepting questions and comments via the chat window. At the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer, or possibly the top right if you are on a different device, you should be able to see an option for chat. If you click that, it will open the chat window where you can type your questions so that they may be read aloud and answered. Thank you, and enjoy the event. Please note, the views and opinions expressed in this virtual event and presentation are solely those of the individual artists in their personal capacity and are not reflective of nor represent official policy, position, or views of New Jersey City University. Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Um, I'm Stephanie Chaikin. I'm the director of the Center for the Arts at New Jersey City University. And we have an amazing program for you today. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Dr. Midori Yoshimoto, our gallery's director, is back from sabbatical. And um, we're going to be presenting uh, an artist talk with Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams. Um, the exhibition, you're having a studio tour right now. Um, the, the exhibition, Burn, Origins, and Resistance, is on view. So after today, please come and see it. Um, in the Visual Arts Gallery, January 31st through March 3rd. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Midori. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm speaking from uh, the Visual Arts Building at New Jersey City University. And this is the auditorium next to the gallery because of the COVID, we decided to expand our uh, site of the event. We are really pleased to present the artwork by our own Dr. Antoinette Ellis Williams. She's the chair and professor of women and gender studies at New Jersey City University. Dr. Ellis Williams is an emerging Jamaican born multimedia abstract contemporary artist and poet, in case the students here were not aware <laughs> of that side of uh, professor. Uh, Audible selected her for the first phase of the Newark Artist Collaboration. Her mural is up in Newark currently, and her recent exhibitions include Aquava Gallery, Curio Art Fair, Prism Art Fair in Miami, Florida, uh, with Calibre Gallery. She also recently curated exhibition of group show um, called as Games People Play at the Bridge Arts Gallery. It's at the Bayonne, New Jersey until the end of this month. And her work in, is in uh, multiple locations throughout, uh, in and out of the state, including Morristown Performing Arts Center. And even tonight, she has another opening of uh, exhibition to open at the uh, Greek consulate in New York, which is open until March 9. That's just to mention a few of her really extra busy months and next month. So uh, we're really pleased to have her here in person to speak to us from the gallery today. Thank you. And if you have any question, please uh, post it on the chat. Thank you, Midori. I'm so honored to be in this amazing space uh, in the Visual Arts Building. I wanna thank the Center for the Arts for all that you've done and all that you continue to do for us. Provo Joshi to the College of Arts and Sciences. This project came about as a result of my 2020 uh, fall semester sabbatical. I had lots of support. I, had, I received a grant from the Newark Artists Accelerator Grant from Project for Empty Space and the City of Newark Creative Catalyst Fund. Could not have done this without our administrative assistant, Patricia Catrillo, Tiana Watson, who uh, is the administrative assistant in this place, helped to design the flame text. Uh, my family, my husband, Junius, Che and, and uh, Junius, to the community, my church, my daughters, to the galleries, to my students, hey there, 
Uh, thank you so much. So I begin with this narrative. I wanna position the work with an origin story that we don't hear, an origin story that we have never heard. In the beginning, God created first woman, black, molded from mother earth, she was everything. She was perfect from her hair to her hips, to the snap and her wit. She was perfect. In the beginning, Black women loved and lived in communities as leaders, teachers, healers, innovators, judges, and mothers. Black women relied on kinship networks to build strong families and compassionate sisterhood with one another. They found ways to ease the pain and always bring joy. In the beginning, Black women created tools, crafts, art, dance, music, storytelling, and food that nourished the body, minds, and souls of those around them. Black women celebrated their beauty with vibrant colors, elaborate hairstyles, and unique cultural flair. Their laugh caused the birds to sing. In the beginning, Black women were perfect and whole. But as colonization, capitalism, racism, patriarchy, and misogyny slithered into their garden, their agency was tempered. Their physical, through physical, sexual, emotional, and spiritual violence, poverty, and oppression. Their culture was decimated, appropriated, and reappropriated into unrecognizable splinters. They were erased, brutalized, and misrepresented throughout history. In the beginning, Black women resisted with systemic oppression, against systemic oppression. Black women became fire to fight the burn. The burn project, you ask, what is it? It's a multidisciplinary, visual, poetic, literary, and ethnographic study of how history, socio, political, cultural, economic, divided in three phases. Origin and activism, which is this phase, Second phase coming up, representation, body, beauty, and girlhood, and finally healing and memory. Phase one, I interviewed 14 women. I did 2D and 3D work. I did abstract. I created a map. I did all kinds of things to unpack a very rich history and narrative. Octavia Butler said from the Parables of Talents, in order to rise from its own ashes, a phoenix must first burn. So here we are, burn. So I wanna draw your attention to the first piece that we have here. It's called Black on Black on Black on Black on Black. Six Blacks, Black on Black on Black on Black. It is oil and it's also uh, cold wax on canvas. And so one of the things that I did with this collection is I really deconstructed fire. I looked at the chemistry of fire. I looked at the colors of it. I looked at the physics of it, how it grew, what was the hottest part of the fire. And I used those colors as layers. So if you come in closely, you will think that you only see black, but black, as you know, is the color with the most depth. And so as you, you pull in, you say, well, what am I looking at? Part of what I wanted us to do, and I wanted to consider the layers that Black women use for protection, community, agency, sisterhood, resistance, joy, and indeed spirit and God. So those are also the layers. Ashes. We all know ashes, right? So throughout this, con this, this collection, I use every aspect of fire, whether it's charcoal, graphite, whether it's the actual ashes, whether it's things that cause fire. And I wanted to see how I can manipulate it through different techniques. So I start here with black on black on black on black because we are black and blackity black, all right? But before we go any further throughout this collection, it is important for us to pause and to say her name. This is an oil painting that I created after Brianna Taylor's death, and it's called Autumn's Fire, Brianna's Forest. And so I wanted us to pause for a moment to remember the Sandra Blands, 
the cisgendered and transgendered black and brown women that we have lost and why we do this work. So if we can take that moment right now. I need a tissue. Thank you. When I think of, and I did this in autumn and uh, an impressionistic painting and I wanted to not think in a dreary way. I wanted us to have this boldness in remembrance. I wanted us to um, think of the fire and think of the colors that are there, but always remember and say their names. So in 2019, something happened to me, right? If you look at this uh, abstract piece, this mixed media piece, there are layers of skin. In 2019, I suffered a second and third degree burn. I'll save you the uh, details. But what happened after 12 to 15 minutes of having uh, something happen, an ice pack on me, I felt nothing. I felt relief. I thought I was good. And so I was excited because the pain that I had was relieved by the ice that I put on it, not knowing that it peeled away my skin, not knowing that I would have to be treated by the burn center for over a year in a second and third degree. This was the beginning of this project because so many times black women suffer burn and they don't even feel it. It becomes normalized. It becomes what we are supposed to do. And in the meantime, we see our skin falling off. And it was interesting after I did this piece, I kind of put it away. And as I looked at it, things started to fall off. And that's what happened. And I think it's important to understand that it's not normal to normalize pain, but this is what black women have done. So let's even take it further back. Let's look at the relationships between mothers and daughters. Justin is with me. He's gonna follow me around uh, as we go. So these are very large pieces over here, very um, conceptual work. There is a theory within um, health and particularly dealing with infant mortality as it relates to black women. And it's called the weathering theory that somehow black women have to withstand a lot more. They have to, to deal with issues of access and affordability and issues of um, having the right information. So I thought about weather and things that happen to the, the bodies of black women. So I wanted to look at that. So I took a canvas and I dated it. My sabbatical officially began in September, but in August, I took a piece of canvas outside and I treated it for several months with all kinds of things as I, I've told you about. Um, I have video of it um, and I would turn it and I would do certain things with it and I put it in the sun. And I watched it change, and I watched what happened to it. But what was really interesting is that this outer part became very hard, right? It became very tough. And then I thought about what do mothers do and how do they pass this on to their daughters? Um, and so I wanted to find out what would happen if I use an imprinting uh, monoprint technique to look at the daughter. And so here's the mother. And I started this one in August. And then sometime around October, I did this piece. <clears throat> it's a larger piece and I, I like that. And I put it on top of it. And if you come to the show, there are QR codes and you'll get to see me walking on top of the canvas. I also turned it and did all kinds of things to it and I wanted to know what kind of memory Black mothers leave with their daughters. And if you look, you can see some things that are really harsh, right? Some hard lines that are in here. Some of the things that really transfer. But you also see that the daughter picks up her own story. She picks up her own sense of, of uh, history. And, and she also has a tapestry that she will pass on. The piece in between, which, um, so that's the mother, that's the daughter, and this one's called Feel My Heat. 
this is the process, part of the process that I used. This is a photo, nothing has done, I have not done nothing with it. I took the canvas and I would put it out on a fence in our yard. The sun would peer through it. I have video of the wind and hearing what the wind does. You get to see different points of light. And so if you see this very definite hard piece, this is what it looked like. And you could see it over here of the kind of pain and imprinting that's left on the mother. Because what I did after it was like this, I, I, I washed it and I put different kinds of uh, solvents on it. And it started out like this. This is part of the uh, chemistry of what was going on about it. And what was interesting for me was this red that came out. Um, and it really was very telling because I didn't change the substances too much. So it's this, something happened to the mother and, I, and I'm the only daughter of my mother. And to hear those stories of what our mother went through, it's powerful. But as her daughter, I too have my own story. So this is, this is the beginning of it. This is what we talk about. But you know what? I said something in the beginning that this is not a victim stories, there is resistance. And so Justin, we're gonna go over to our, to our women and to look at those women and see the colors that are coming out. Again, this is the Black Women Are Perfect series. These are the pictures that you have seen on all the advertisements. Again, I'm using the colors of a uh, fire. Uh, I'm using digital collaging. In this piece in particular, which is my favorite one, uh, it includes an oil abstract painting that I did. It includes photos that I did. It includes etchings that I did and a silhouette. <clears throat> and it was taken at different times of the day in our yard. The sun was a particular place. And so this one is me. <laughs> um, she's the red sister. She's the one that is holding something that I think is incredibly uh, powerful. Um, I think that she is very much uh, sure of who she is, um, but she's not forgetting that. And this is the same, if you look at this, it's the same shape that is mirrored in uh, the pieces that came before. Now we look at the fire, the blue part of the flame tends to be the hottest. Many people forget about that. This one is fight the power sister. This one to me, this one came up during the social unrest and it includes uh, images of European police in Belarus during uh, some of the summer unrest. It includes these figures that look almost like a hive, a beehive. And so the bodies of black women are policed, but in that beehive, there is fire, right? There is honey, there's something that can get us through. I am particularly drawn to, to lines and to creating those, those uh, caverns and creating those avenues, if you will, uh, and finding ways out. All of these are finding their way out. And I think finally, the orange leaf, this is the fall. This is a time when that same um, fence was happening. And this came from our yard in the front of the yard, actually. This beautiful tree, there's a sense of peace, but there's also a sense of, of sureness, a sense that there is uh, power and there is this resolve, but it's not uneasy. It's a very sure, focused, orange sense. And if you look and you follow her up and right in here, you'll see this flame. Right here, there's this light that comes through. Right, so don't underestimate what's going on. Again, you see this line, it's repeated again in a different way. This angle comes back around. And in this, you even see roots coming forward. So when you come to see this work, I want you to really lean in and really try and understand and unpack some of the things that are going on. So in the beginning, I said, Justin, that it was perfect, but then some things happened. Right, uh, Tiana, get me my phone real quick. 
over here, we have a deconstructed flag, American flag. There's red, there's white, and there's blue. So digital collage on metal. So I wanted to also play with different uh, substances and to see what would happen if you print these collages on something so hard. Breasts, right? Breasts are objectified. Black women's breasts are objectified. In the beginning, some people might say, oh, isn't this lovely? There's also this burlap that comes in. Um, you see the fence again, and then you see these leaves. This for me is about the breeding system in the United States. I wanted to read some of my, my uh, research and Gregory Smither says in uh, the book, Slave Breeding, Sex, Violence and Memory in African-American History, quote, my master started out with two women, slaves and raised 300 slaves. To testify John Smith, a 108 year old former slave who was interviewed by Workers Project said, and he testified, he recalled that short Peggy and long Peggy, the two women his master started out with were prized for their fertility. The sexual exploitation that Smith called these women's experience led to the reproduction of slaves who enrich Smith's master through their labor. What is told in this, one of those women gave birth to 25 children. They then, those two women by themselves are the mother, grandmother of 300, 300 offsprings as a result of their 25. This is what America is built on, free black women's bodies. We have to look at it. We have to be uncomfortable about it and we have to remember it. But again, these women over here are saying, don't, don't get upset because we are dealing with it. Right, we have our fight the power system, but you cannot fight the power if you don't address what's here. So as you go in, this one is the charcoal fence. So I use that fence, uh, that motif again. Um, this one over here is disrespect breasts. And I say disrespect because it's not only past, but this one also leads to the present, if you will. Right, so the narrative of objectification and exploitation of black women's bodies to build wealth continues. So this kind of gets us to this cloudy part, this cloudy night, a place that uh, we can run. When did black women and people go for freedom in the dark? Where were you safe in the dark? Where were you unsafe in the dark? The dark, a lot of things happen. This is a photo that I did not manipulate uh, at all. It was taken on our street. Uh, what I do have is a digital collaging of fabric, and you'll see fabric used throughout this, and I'm going to say more about it, uh, and you'll see the fabric that's burnt, not only with iron, but with curling irons and with flat irons. Um, so I did a lot of burning of fabric to be able to create some of these, um, these collages. Well, in the beginning, Black women were perfect. Here she is, here's my girl, the black goddess with the golden lips. Now, if you look at this, Justin made a great observation. I was very intentional about making sure that the break came close to her mouth, but there is this goal that is also placed on it, right? If you look at how the, the mouth is and how the iron is, your voice is silenced, but your teeth are there. Your voice may be silent, but you have not lost your teeth. And so I wanted to make sure she was really beautifully black and to lean into her rich color because I think it's, there's power in that. And so to be able to look at that break, that little sunlight that comes out despite what we have in front of us. So I'm gonna go to, now we've talked about this, this activist. So we're gonna go over to an activist center right here. This is a piece that's textile. And you see, I do all kinds of art, right? So there's stitching here. My grandmother was a seamstress. We came from Jamaica 
And my grandmother used to have lots of scraps of fabric and strings under her sewing machine. She used to wash clothes for white people. And you can always find a clothespin and a safety pin. I'm gonna get back to the clothespin. So I wanted to create, over here we have this flag. I wanted to think about what is the African-American, the black woman's flag? And so I created this flag. This is my American stitches flag. There's red, white, and blue, but it brings with it those things from the continent. It brings with it these carry shells. This is how we traded in West Africa. We had our money. You had to keep a little money, right? My grandmother used to keep a little money in her, in her brazier, right? You always got to keep a little money. Your things that you fight with, of course, are safety pins. Um, and I, I like this a lot. I'm going to continue to work on this some more. And um, some people have suggested that I make it on a large scale. So I am going to try and do that. In this project, you're going to see lots of clothespins, lots of clothespins. Why am I talking about clothespins? Everyone knows Harriet Tubman. If you look at Harriet Tubman's clothespins, you will see clothespins that have been dyed with curry and turmeric and chamomile. And some of them are here and you can smell them. Harriet Tubman was a laundry woman. She washed clothes for white people. Most of the women activists from the 1800s through even the mid 1950s were washwomen. Madam C.J. Walker, a washwoman. Most of the black women that we find wash clothes. So I said, in looking at this burn, I'm gonna consider this a fire stick. What if we use these as resistant tools? So I am, uh, conceptualizing, naming those things that create fire. And I think that in order to deal with the burn, you have to create a resistance fire. So here's someone who created a resistance fire, stagecoach Mary, right? Mary was born in the 1800s um, in Tennessee after the Civil War ended followed the Mississippi River, ended up in Ohio. She's a woman who was tall. She dressed as a man. She ended up going to a convent where white women were nuns. She would take care of the grounds. They liked that. She smoked, she cussed, she drank. Um, the father that was above them <laughs> heard of her and said, listen, you guys can't keep this, this woman around. She, she, she can't do this. So Mother Superior of that convent got her a stagecoach and she became the, sec the second woman, first black woman in American history to deliver mail on a stagecoach. If you don't think about stagecoaches back in the uh, late 1800s, early 1900s, very dangerous. I wanted to also make sure that we understood that black women carry guns. Ida B. Wells wore a gun up her skirt. They weren't against making sure that they were safe. She handled herself. She took care of um, business. She got a little too old. She ended up uh, retiring. But for me, her story is a story we don't hear about. She was also a washwoman, a laundry woman, fire sticks. This project asks you to do something personal. When you come to the show, I want you to pause. I want you to think about the sacrifices of Black women's bodies, how religious organizations, Western, have manipulated um, what faith means, and yet Black women continue to have faith. So I, had, I saved this writing for today because I'm gonna write down the name of somebody that um, has helped me to create my fire. And that's my grandmother, Gladys Wint. When you come to the show, I want you to think about not just the people, 
but the things that got you over, you know, the songs, the, um, the sayings. And I want to tell you some of those uh, in a minute. But before we can get to that, I want us to look at this, this centerpiece here. Remember Harriet Tubman? She was the great conductor of the Underground Railroad. Let's imagine this is a map, an interactive map, if you will. If you notice, you see some climbing up. You see some that are different colors. There's, there's movement that's suggested. Trying to get north, trying to get to Canada. How do we get there? When you come in here, you're going to see uh, pieces of glass. You're going to see, if you look close enough, you're going to see those colors of red showing up again. Um, but we're imagining the lives of these people on this map that were freed as a result of a black woman who was a washwoman, a woman who washed clothes like my grandmother for white people. And through this, she pushed through. We know that she was a spy. She helped um, with the war. She's somebody that America owes a great deal to. Um, take some time and pause, if you will. I went with my husband to South Carolina and we were hoping to get to the Combahee River, but I had the map of the Combahee River in mind as I did this piece and thought about where the river would flow. And so there's certain areas where it goes down a little lower with the rivers. There's certain places that I imagine might be a safe house. There's certain places that are not so safe. So this is this, this map. And again, the fire sticks. So what I want you to do, and I'm hoping to do, when you come into the show, I created an altar. We don't have all of the, the things here, but you will see, don't touch it when you come in here though. Maybe you can touch some of them. The red ones um, were done in hibiscus um, and some other red herbs. The yellow, of course, like I said, done in, um, turmeric and chamomile. And I wrote on over 700 clothespins during my research, researching ways and people that helped the burn. So I wanna offer my grandmother Gladys Wint to this altar as someone, as a, as a true person that helped to get us to this place. So you're gonna take these fire sticks and guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna have it burn. This is the fire memorial. We could not have done this without Tiana, without, without Patricia helping. What I have done here is I have created list of women and inventions that black women have created. Uh, everything that black women use from sweet potatoes to sexuality, to Beyonce's lemonade, to Ella Fitzgerald, to hot sauce and museums and Brittany Cooper, eloquent rage. And this takes our fire up. And this to me is really the pinnacle of, of what burn is about. It's about resisting. And so here is this flame that we should always remember and always add to it. Because yeah, we got baby, Re we got Riri down there. We got Kathleen Battle. We have refused to be quiet. When you're here, take some time to look at it. Take some time to think about who these people are. I'm hoping that maybe I can get a grant because I wanna create a, a digital site that gives information on every single fire stick. Who are these people? And in this gallery, in this experience, I want you to know that you're not leaving by yourself. You, you think you started by yourself, but you didn't. This monoprint that's in this alcove is the fire dancers. You always gotta dance and you don't dance by yourself, but you, you dance together and it might be hot, but guess what? There is still this imprinting. We get back to that imprinting again of women together dancing, dancing and resisting and in the fire dance. And so, this monoprint, I think, is, is for me, it, it touches me. Um, Midori mentioned Audible, that I have a, a mural up, and it's dancers. 
And I didn't know how much dance meant for me until I saw my work in these two spaces. And so the last thing that I wanna show you is one further installation that is a digital um, piece of work with several, with several other pieces that I have that are watercolor, that are uh, ink, and it's very uh, personal. It's another burn story. And if we have a moment, we wanna listen or see a little bit of it. I adore my grandmother, but every day I see the scar on my right hand. I don't recall a few trust, just the smoldering back on my skin. I don't remember sleeping. Maybe I must. I don't remember. My grandmother holding the hand on my wrist. So some people have wondered if that's a true story. It is in fact a true story. Um, and I told somebody this story, another woman from an island and she also had a similar story. And so we end this with this piece that says, meet me at the gate, right? There is the, the metaphor of what gates do keeping out the heavenly gates, the burn gates. Who will let us in? We hope there's a sister on the other side. Who will keep the bad people out? We hope that there is a brother on the other side. So this is a small piece of the collection. Um, I hope that it says something to you and uh, maybe we have some questions uh, from the audience. But thank you for your, your patience and thank you for indulging me. Uh, and thank you so much, Justin, for following me around. I guess there, I'll wait for the next thing. I'm gonna have some questions from the audience. Any questions, uh, Steph? I will start reading the chat. Okay. So Mary has asked, the four works that highlight Black women's objectification are especially powerful. Will you please talk about the elements of the US flag present in these four works? especially the hues of red, white, and blue that you chose to use. Yes, yes, thank you so much. So there, she's asking me about the, uh, the flag. There are really six pieces to it. Um, and I wanted to use fabric, I use burlap. Uh, burlap is another fabric that I use in, in putting the narrative together. So uh, I think burlap is always used for those that are, are poor, it's not a fabric that's um, considered valuable and it's rough. And I wanted to 
uh, play with that fabric and that texture against the uh, red, white, and blue. And I wanted to play with the hues of a deeper kind of blue. And even this, this blue that I mentioned, that's a little bit even more modern because I want us to sit with the uncomfortableness of today uh, and what that means. If you look at this piece, the red one, you will see that there are definite suggestions of these blue lines uh, here. I'm not, of course, doing it literal. This is conceptual work and it's uh, abstract. So I wanna um, force the viewer to look at it differently. Of course, the areolas are our eyes, they're bullets, they're targets. Um, that's the other thing that I want us to, to think about. Um, there's some things, if you look at this one, you can almost look at it as if there's a face and a body lying upside down in a ship and another body lying this way. Mother, again, the imprinting, mothers and daughters, they're women that are together going through this experience. Another question, I think I have a noted artist in here, Ben Jones. <laughs> So, um, yeah, that's a great question. So, the, thank you. So, you can, uh, if you can read it, because we don't have a mic on Ben. So yeah, I'm, you, I'm repeating it. Professor Ben Jones asked the question of the three pieces that I have. How do I plan on um, extending it and bringing it forward? I would like to make them larger. I mentioned that in phase two, I'm dealing with body and representation and girlhood. So I'm going to play with scale um, and look at somehow finding the girl in this. I'm hoping to have a young woman as a curator to help me think about some of these things. But I, I like very much the idea of scaling up some of these works. And so you, maybe you can help me know where I'm supposed to go to do this, you know, because I'm doing this in my living room right now. So I think, I, I think I'll step into some other things. Stephanie, you have another we do. Another question. Um, with the pieces representing the mother and daughter. Mother and daughter pieces. Are the weathering process to create the piece similar but created different results in its completion? Yes, excellent question. There are, yes and no, because the mother stands by herself and, and ideally she doesn't stand by herself, but I created her absent of any imprinting specifically with another canvas. I started this with dumping charcoal and ashes and all kinds of things. And it took a lot longer for, for it to really um, become embedded. I took this canvas and I put it on top. So I had some assistance with the daughter. That's what happens with mothers and daughters, right? Um, here is a mom with a daughter. You look and some things are very familiar. You, you really don't want this piece that we see, this hand that we see. We don't wanna see it end up in our daughter, but guess what, it does. But if you notice, it's a little lighter and it happens lighter if mothers are able to talk and tell that story. There's a lot of taboo within our culture about not saying that I was sexually abused, not saying that something happened or uncle so-and-so did this. So the girl doesn't know that this, this is even possible. But I think what needs to happen is that we have these conversations in an honest way, not in a way that sensationalizes things and not in a way that even invites strangers in. But I think that the kitchen table, sometimes you sort clothes. I remember one of my earliest memories, my grandmother taught me how to sort, and my mother, how to sort my father's socks. They all looked blue, but they weren't all blue. And that was my job. And somehow I really enjoyed doing this. And it was done at the table. And so I think more of those tables and more of those places where we sort the clothes, uh, we no longer have clothes lines. We no longer have clothes pins, but I'm suggesting that we find ways to have clothes pins something that holds us together, holds the fabric and the memories together. That's what I'm suggesting. Any more questions there, Steph? Yeah, um, Sabrina has a, a whole list. She's gonna read them. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Crystal Limonius. Um, are you making your own black paints to assist in the differentiation among the black paints you described in black on black on black? I am, I, I, I don't know what I'm doing, but I created my own black space. 
um, the question was, do I create my own black or black? So I, I bought several black and I used those other primary colors um, in the layering process. And yeah, so I, I, I mixed and I created those, those things. I'm looking to expand that and develop that and learn how to do it. I use different kinds of uh, mediums in it, different kinds of viscosity, uh, different kinds of uh, feel. Um, I, I'm a very much a feel and sight person. So that's how I figured it out, but I did mix those myself. Next question. Oh, here's a question from Midori. Okay, I'll repeat the question. Maybe I can speak closer to you. Okay. So, um, Antoinette, uh, as a fellow uh, faculty member, I'd like to ask you a question, uh, how your teaching feed into your creative work? That's a great question. It's a great question because this is new to me. Um, and my students who are in there and women in leadership, I'm hoping that you're able to, think about the kinds of tools that women use in order to resist. Um, I also teach women in hip hop, and I'm hoping that when we look at this flame, uh, people would say automatically, okay, I don't want Mona Lisa. And that's not Mona Lisa from, from uh, Paris. That's a, a, a woman in hip hop. What do they have to do with anything? There's something that these women do. And so I want us to disrupt the narrative and I want us to think about the public sphere. I want to think about how we can disrupt it in a way that's not traditional and not to assume that everything is negative. That's why I wanted to take the time to talk about that origin story. In the beginning, black women were perfect. And, and I like that Justin is going and looking down the flame because what you also see in this macrame and this weaving, because I also, uh, it's weaving, my fingers are probably still hurting, and it has the uh, clothespins, but it also has at the top, you see those carry shells and you see them coming through, right? So that, that's the memory and the richness of our culture that we bring with us. Sometimes it's not as visible and you have to, you have to go up close, but you can't lose that. That's part of, that's, I think that's part of what's happening. We sort of get rid of the clothespins, we get rid of the carry shells, and then, then what you see, you see that you're naked. You're not naked if you carry your culture with you and you understand it. Now, it's okay that you might wear something because it's Black History Month and it's kind of cute. It becomes even meaning, more meaningful if you understand what that flag means. You understand that a grandmother used to take those patches and PBS just did a story about fashion and denim and the dungaree and how that denim is political and how you use these patches. We had patches back in the day and you used to have to iron them on. My mother, because I had four brothers, my mother would, and grandmother would iron them on the back. I never had a patch because I guess I wasn't rude and running around. I had one time I had a hole, but they didn't put a patch in it. And so how do you patch up those things? Don't throw it away. Don't throw away the fact that, you know, you made a mistake or society says you're not a good girl or you know i don't meet this standard or that standard we're very quick to point out the holes and we don't talk about the patches oh why does she have to come with her body out hold on you don't know why she showed up that way you don't know what that really means so when you lean into it make sure you go over to this sacred place first make sure you understand that underneath all of that, there's some twine, there's some, there's some rope, there's some things that are binding us that we think are good. We think are good and, and uh, they're not necessarily all that good, but we can't forget about them. Now I'm preaching. My brother said to me before, he said, you'll be fine because you become a preacher. Okay, Stephanie, or you guys have some more questions? I know we have about five more minutes before my students get up and decide to leave. Do. I'm going to read a, a question from Doris. Okay, question Dr. from Doris. Swallow. How wonderful that Professor Ben Jones is in the exhibition with you during yes, this. Yes, how wonderful it is that Ben Jones is here. Hour. Woo. Um, <laughs> thank you for the fantastic talk, Dr. Ellis Williams. I will be visiting the exhibition with my students for class next week. Thrilled thank to you. see what reactions and conversations your work will make space for and encourage. Is there a particular question you would put forward to ask the visitor and particularly a student visitor? 
Um, I don't want to presuppose a, a, a question for the student or for anyone. I want you to come in and experience it, right? I want you to come in and uh, look at it from your perspective um, because I want to learn from you too, right? You know, the pieces are, are one thing, but the viewer will create some other narratives to help all of us. I think that's the role of the artist, not to um, just push something down someone's throat. It's now for you to sit back and say, hmm, you know what? I think I should add this name because of A, B, and C. You know, I noticed you didn't put up somebody, you didn't put up your dog up here. Why not, Dr. Ellis? Oh, that's a good question. Maybe I should have. Well, you should I put Sounder up there? Maybe I should have. So I think we have to remain open. I think that the work allows us to breathe, but I think it challenges us. I hope that you don't forget that you got to pause and say their name. I hope you don't forget that right up here, there's power. Don't just go right to the, to the bad stuff. Don't forget that there is this um, fight the power sister. Don't forget that there's these other women. And many times we like to glamorize just the bad. So those things are put in there in context. It's a whole story. All right, I have another question. Okay. Um, from Yannick. Um, Yannick, what, okay. What directs your selection of materials and techniques for each piece does the story you want to tell guide the process or vice versa? That's a great question. Is this Yannick in Jamaica? My goodness, Yannick. Um, as I said, I was very intentional about this collection. I wanted to use pieces that were involved in fire. These are gypsum that are used to start those fires in fire pits. Um, oil paint, and the flame in the forest was intentional. I think I'm really drawn to texture a lot, even in the pieces that are not collage pieces, I believe in layering. I believe that there's a lot underneath that we have to use. And so that brings up, I think, a lot of um, rich stories. Like even the, I have about six of these encaustic pieces in different sizes. And I, I wanted them to sort of continue this feeling with the burlap and these strings and ropes. I don't have to tell you what they're about. You know what those are about. You know what they're about. I don't have to show you a lynching. You know what it's about. So I, I don't have to say that. You can understand it. So I want to be able to use some other things that are not the traditional tropes, but invite us to really unpack in a new way. And so that's what I'm drawn to. I'm, I'm going to bring some more clothespins because I suspect we're gonna have an onslaught of people coming to the gallery. And I'm gonna ask that when you put your clothespin there that I get to keep them, that we build on it as we continue the show wherever it goes or however it goes. So um, that's something I want the students to be able to do. Not, don't be afraid to do it. You don't have to be black to have somebody that has meaning in your life. This is what it's about. What has gotten you to NJCU? We're, we're a school of immigrants, first generation, working class people of all races and all ethnicities. You got a fire stick. You have something that you can use. So I want you to use what you have. Amazing. Ben is in here having church. Anyone else I out there say, having Doctor, church? I was just gonna say, Dr. Jones, do you have some more questions for us? Dr. Jones, did you have any questions? Tiani, you have any questions? We only have another minute left because I don't want people, I think we're going to be fine. So uh, I'm going to sign off. I want to thank you for, for handling my work with grace. I want to thank you for being open to this conversation, Midori. Um, I want to thank you, Tiana, for helping to tell that story. Ben Jones, years ago, I showed you some stuff on my phone and you said, she ready. And you had me do some work. I would not be here if it wasn't for you. Justin, I'm talking just to you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, to my grandmother, uh, I hope she's pleased. To my father, who is my angel, I hope he says, little girl, well done. To my mother who has worked very hard, I hope I've brought grace. And so I always think about the fact that I'm here because of lots of people. I'm humbled to my students that are sitting out there. 
uh, I want you to know that you can do anything. You can do anything. I am an emerging, not trained official artist. And I'm showing in one of the top galleries with one of the finest colleagues who are artists. Anything is possible. Thank you very much to the Center of the Arts. Have a good week. Peace. Thank you so very much, Antoinette. Oh my gosh, there's just, I can't even start of words. You just inspired us so much. Thank you. Um, Midori, thank you so much. I'm going to, I'm going to, I want to thank Anna Carhart, our theater manager, Justin Tinker, our amazing photographer and technical director, Sabrina Sabalo, our box office manager and Zoom coordinator. And I'm going to turn this back over to you, Midori, to give some closing words. But actually, first, I'm going to tell you, <laughs> take it back. Um, we have some upcoming events that we would love you to join us for in the Lemmerman Gallery um, in Hepburn Hall. Thank God I'm Home, First Meal by Julie Green, February 2nd through March 25th. And we will have a virtual talk by the former New York Times national correspondent, Kirk Johnson and Sarah Somervold of the Center on Wrongful Convictions. That is March 4th. Um, you can get tickets on njcu.edu slash arts. We have an amazing program this Saturday, um, Igniting the Imagination, an evening of music and exploration of David Bowie's creative process. Um, Professor Martha Mook performed on David Bowie's albums, so we've got an inside look there. And coming up, um, the English annual English Department annual 100 word reading marathon, Still There is Love, hosted by Dr. Edvidge Junta and Peggy Jackson and Kylie Moore on Tuesday, the 15th of February. So you can take all your um, Valentine's thoughts and bring them to us. And I think we have one more to tell you about. Um, we have two programs, um, The Late Homecomer, a Hmong family memoir, and The Brief Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow. They're staged presentations from the books. So njcu.edu slash arts, please sign up for everything and follow us. We have a whole semester of amazing programs.